Four keys we called them. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, and thank you for attending Lidnock's monthly uh, events. Um, this month here, we will have John Robbins, uh, eventually co-founder, doing a in-depth. Uh, well, I got some feedback. Sorry, guys. Do you want me to take over? Yeah, yeah that's me now? Yep. You were okay before. Oh, I'll get a feedback. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, John Robbins will take through a, a tour of the debugger in this studio and show us some of the, the nifty tricks about uh, how to manage your breakpoints and all the fun things. <coughs> Just a big thank to our um, our sponsors, that's Orcsweb for managed hosting solution, Telerik, uh, everybody knows Telerik, and PostSharp. Thank you very much, guys, for continuing to support us and the little community. Upcoming events, we have a Scott Guthrie Unplugged Session 9 coming on the 26th of October, and we have had a uh, semi-100% <laughs> confirmation that we will definitely get him on board this month. He's obviously been very busy in his new job uh, on the Azure team, so I'm sure there will be lots of questions around what he actually is doing now. In November, we will have Shay Friedman doing, <coughs> giving us a bit of a tour of C Sharp, and that's on the 17th of November. Now we've got more events coming up, of course, but these are the next two ones. Bit of info about Linux, uh, that's our group, uh, the calendars, uh, Eventbrite, uh, which is where you can find out our events, upcoming events, lidnockevents.eventbrite.com, um, for social media people, there's uh, Twitter, says Lidnock, Facebook, says Lidnock, and of course email at lidnock.org if you have a question to anybody. Um, thanks to all the management team and the moderators for their great work in keeping Lidnock clean and the the premier source of the net for .NET. I'm going to hand over to John. John, thank you very much. This is your second time in a very short period of time. On Lidnock, thank you very much for coming back and uh, handing over to you. Oh, well, thank you very much, Brian. It's great to be back, and it's great to talk to everybody through Lidnock again. I think it's a, uh, you guys are doing a great uh, uh, organization. I know I uh, uh, have been enjoying a lot of the conversations that have been taking place up on LinkedIn and, and everything else. So uh, it's great to be back. So uh, let's take a break in the debugger, okay? Uh, don't worry. Uh, this is going to be a demo-only presentation, but you know, I just want to give everybody a chance to uh, uh, get my email address is the main thing here. Because what we're going to talk about in this session is, is about tips and tricks about programming your debugger to solve problems. Because uh, I know uh, I won't require a show of hands, but uh, uh, I know many of you have not read the Visual Studio documentation, and there's all sorts of power around uh, programming this debugger, and there's a lot of unique tricks that we can do to make this your debugging experience faster and better. And the, and the faster you debug, the better off you're going to be because you're going to get your job done faster. So that's what we're going to talk about here is kind of really focus around those breakpoints and around the issues of what's going on. Uh, a couple things before we get started. Uh, just so you know, my resolution is set to 1024 by 768. Uh, so most of you, you know, I wanted to make sure it was something that you guys would see. And if you're new to Live Meeting, which is a great, uh, great presentation tool and a, and a desktop sharing tool, you can always press F5, and that will maximize the window uh, so you can see all of the demos and, and everything that I'm going to do. But uh, the big thing on the screen there is john at wintelweck.com. If you have any questions after this presentation or you're hearing it through the recording, please send an email because uh, I'll be happy to answer the questions that you've got. Because one of the things I've learned in this business is that I learn a ton from your questions, and so I'm more than happy to take them. If I don't know the answer, somebody else at Wintelweck does. And just very briefly, uh, you probably have heard of Winnelect. You probably heard of my uh, coworkers, uh, Jeffrey Richter, Jeff Procise, guys like Jeremy Lickness. They're all way smarter than I am. Uh, but we're a big uh, consulting training uh, debugging firm concentrating on, on Windows and .NET and now Windows 8 and all of that. Uh, so we do a lot of stuff so you can learn a lot more at Winnelect.com. 
So let's get into talking about uh, setting breakpoints. And here's what's very, very unique about this environment that we have as .NET window developers. I don't care what type of development that you're doing. If you're doing Silverlight development, this talk applies to you. If you're doing WCF, this talk applies to you. If you're doing Azure, this talk applies to you. If you're doing phone development, this talk applies to you. If you're doing WinRT development, this talk applies to you. That's what's very, very unique about uh, 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 those of us developing on the Windows platforms, right? Many people that are on other operating systems and other platforms, right, they've got a different tool for every flavor of thing that they're touching. When it comes to Visual Studio, you're going to do the breakpoints the exact same way that I do them in, in this demo. And I'm just to make life easy, I'm going to use a Windows Forms application. And uh, that will allow us to uh, you know, see things a little bit easier. But the key is that it doesn't matter how you, you work, that's where it's going to go. But before we start debugging, I do have to talk about uh, something very, very important. And I see this, see a lot of people make this mistake is that they start debugging without thinking, okay? And, you know, if you, you know, before you ever sit down and press F5 to start debugging, what you want to do is you want to sit down and think about what it is that you want to accomplish. Because if you don't think about it, you get in trouble. Now, all of you have seen the movie Finding Nemo, right? That's the greatest, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a Pixar movie. You know, it's computer generated, so it's a job requirement that we go. And the problem is, is that uh, many of you have, are, are familiar with, with the Dory the fish, right? Remember, Dory's was the one that would be swimming along, trying to remember everything, be swimming along, but, ooh, ooh, cool, I'm swimming, oh, shiny light, and, you know, kind of go off the deep end. Well, if you get in this debugger without having a hypothesis, you become Dory the debugger. You know, you're debugging along, ooh, cool, I'm debugging, I'm debugging, ooh, shiny variable, and you go off the deep end. So, you know, what, what is it that you want to do? I want to stop when, and write that down, because, you know, that's what we're going to talk about here. We're going to talk about that when part, like getting our application so that we can stop in various spots to make things happen. So let's talk about different ways you can set some breakpoints here uh, in, in, the, in the debugger. So I'll press F11. We'll go ahead and get fired up and uh, start debugging, right? Visual Studio like you've always seen. Well, one place that's very interesting for setting breakpoints here is uh, let's go look at some code, okay? So um, uh, you see folks do something uh, like, oops, my jump here. Oh, by the way, I forgot one last thing about li uh, live meeting here. If you have a question as I'm presenting, this is what the QA manager is for. And I've just brought it up here. If you've got a question, uh, please feel free to type it in. You'll see that everybody will see that a question's been asked, and I'll try to get to those questions uh, as we go through. I will stop during the presentation if anybody's got a question and try to get those answered. So let's go look at a very common scenario that occurs. So I've just got this uh, code that does, you know, a deep call stack of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. And I'll, I'll set my burry point, and, and we'll run uh, uh, my little ugly UI here, my little demo program that, you know, you can see I'm the master of UI design. But let me show you a very common scenario that it's an interesting place to set burry points. So here we are. We've stopped here. And what you see a lot of times is people say, well, I need to go set a breakpoint up the call stack. So they'll get the call stack window out, and they'll say, yeah, I need to set a breakpoint on that button click event. And so they'll double click and bring up that source code and click the button, click the breakpoint there. But are you going to hit that breakpoint? No, because this is a breakpoint that, uh, breakpoints only execute essentially before the line. So I want to stop when I return there, but I, this doesn't, doesn't work, right? And we can see that if we go over to our breakpoints window, and we can see that, you know, we've got breakpoints set on the source and line. So that's kind of a problem. So let's clear these out. And what we'll do now is I'll show you something real cool. So let's get back to where we were in the, in the you know, our current execution location. So here's something neat, a neat place where you can set a breakpoint. It's actually in the call stack window. So I've highlighted the, the, the location here. And if you press F9, that will set a breakpoint on the return address. 
Okay, realize the difference here. Before we set it on the call, now I'm setting it on the return address. So now when I press F5, we'll kick back here, and now we're looking at, hey, great, that's where we, we stopped on the return address. And you can always verify this in the call stack window. When you look, and you look at the breakpoints window, and you'll see that, hey, there is my uh, uh, call stack, you know, there's my breakpoint, but it's set with an offset. So that tells me, ah, I'm setting it on a return address. So, you know, there's just a neat hidden place where you can set some breakpoints, which are kind of cool. Another thing about setting breakpoints, which is kind of fun, is let's get my main program up here. Another place where you can set breakpoints, and I'm going to set a bookmark because we're going to come back and talk about this little section of code quite, quite a bit. So good old control KK sets my bookmark, is I want you to look, oh, by the way, uh, also with the, I'm using C Sharp here. Uh, everything I'm showing you also works with VB and just about any other language, uh, .NET language. So just don't worry about that. I don't, the debugger doesn't care what language you're, you're using. So let's look very closely at this for line for a second. How many executable statements are on that line? Well, if you look closely and I set a breakpoint, you actually have three executable statements because the way C Sharp is, is designed, the semicolon marks the end of a statement. So what I just, how many times is, is this breakpoint I just set going to hit? Well, just once, right? That's like the initializer section of the, uh, the for loop. But if I wanted to set another breakpoint, I've highlighted right now the I less than 10. That's like the, 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 the condition part of the for loop. Well, all you need to do, you don't need to highlight it. You put the cursor in there and then press F9 again. Then you go to the section, to the, to the last section, because there's three executable statements here. It's like the incrementer section or the, the bump section. And I press uh, F9 again, and I get three breakpoints on that line. So I just wanted to point this out, because a lot of times if you do have the scenario where you've got multiple conditions on a line, you can set a breakpoint on, on each one. And if we go back and look at our breakpoints window, you'll see, sure enough, I've got a breakpoint set on line 33, but it's on each of the specific characters. And .NET works that way, uh, even in debug and release builds, because they keep everything perfectly aligned uh, from the debugging simple standpoint. So that's kind of cool. So that's our, our, our sub-expression breakpoints. So next thing I want to turn to is let's talk about quickly breaking on a, on a class or a method. So if you know the name of a class or a method, okay, you don't have to get into your source code and say, well, yeah, I want to set a breakpoint on that method. Let me scroll for half an hour just so I can go um, and set a breakpoint, or better yet, set a breakpoint on the opening curly brace. You don't need to do that. If you know the name of the class and method, all you need to do is go to debug, new breakpoint, break it function. And what this allows you to do, by the way, it's something very important I'm going to tell you here. This use IntelliSense to verify the function name kind of randomly unchecks. Uh, so you always want to leave that checked because it will help. You know, they, they always use the PDB information to uh, verify breakpoints, but they can get some additional hints when it comes to uh, uh, the um, the breakpoints that you're going to set when uh, you use IntelliSense. So it's, it's kind of both pieces of information are used. So if you know the name of the class and method, I'll set it on our Do method, okay? So I just type in the name of the class and method and press OK. And what just happened there? Well, if you scroll down a little bit, ta-da! That set the breakpoint automatically. So this is kind of cool. You know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to go wander all over your source code just to press F9 on a line or click in the margin. You know, just press the keystroke associated with the, the debug new breakpoint uh, option there. It's control B if you use general keyboard settings. But this way it makes it very easy uh, to set that breakpoint. So in fact, what's even better about this is you notice I've got the method T there, T-I. If uh, I want to set a breakpoint on just a method, I can press the, the new breakpoint uh, uh, accelerator code. And what I can now go look at is typing just the individual method in, and I can press OK, and ta-da, we set a breakpoint right there. So this is just one of those really fast, easy-to-do things that will make it very, very easy to set a breakpoint. So some of you are looking at that and going, well, John, that's great. You've got that, that method T. What happens if you have an overloaded method? If I've got a method that has uh, different parameters but with the same name, how is the debugger going to handle it? Well, what we can do, because I know you were going to ask that question because I have extrasensory perception, 
we have two methods called overload there. And those two, two methods, are, you know, just to, to demonstrate this, let's go, let's go make sure my breakpoint or my cursor is someplace else, and I'll press Control B, and I'll type overload, and, oh, which one of those breakpoints did you meet? So how cool is this? The debugger's got a lot of smarts built into it that with the, the PDB and IntelliSense, it will try to do figure out where all of those are across your whole solution. So, you know, the debugger's pretty smart about getting these breakpoints set very, very quickly so you could do big things and not have to worry about uh, – uh, messing around with, uh, uh, you know, hunting down the source code and things like that. Let's get the questions here. Does, ben Kat, does this work for C++? Yes. Uh, pretty much everything I'm going to talk to you about except for one or two things are pretty much the same between all of the environments that you would use. So this, everything I've talked about now works for C++. Okay. So we've got you covered. I'll point out the one thing, there's one thing in particular that does not work, okay? Ah, Sebastian, this is, this is neat. This is a great question. If your module isn't loaded and, and, and uh, the lately bound is a good way of, of describing it in debugger terms, that means it is a uh, unresolved breakpoint. So what that will do is that if the breakpoint doesn't expect, let, let me demonstrate this for you, Sebastian. So uh, let's pick one, I'll just call it foo. And uh, it will come up, and you'll see, oh, IntelliSense couldn't find the information. Do you still want to set the breakpoint? That will set what is known as, uh, even, though, even though it shows up here, this uh, breakpoint hasn't been executed yet. This is an unresolved breakpoint. So even if you set this, what it will do is that when the, the, the DOL or the assembly that has that foo method in it comes in, it will try to resolve it. So the, the, the correct, the behavior you want is the default behavior. So uh, it will handle the weightly bound or the unresolved breakpoints for you. So that's a great question. Oh, the keystroke for setting the break on return, Chris, in the uh, 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 call stack window, all you have to do is press F9 on a line. And what that will do is that that will set the breakpoint on the return address. So it's just the same thing as if your cursor is on a line pressing F9. Okay, so great questions, guys. Great questions. But you know, I hope I was able to show you, you know, the, the fact that that you know, don't be afraid to use the, these kind of advanced functionality. Go set breakpoints quickly so you can concentrate on what you need to concentrate on, and not have to worry about like let's go find it in the source code and everything else. Let me clear these breakpoints, and I want to show you something else that's kind of interesting. So. Um, I got to speak at TechEd a few years ago here in, here in the U.S., and uh, a very, very interesting thing happened. Uh, uh, first off, my talk got moved, and it was kind of weird because they almost never move talks, and uh, my talk was originally scheduled at 2 p.m., and they moved it to 7 p.m. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound good, but, you know, it didn't, it wasn't very good because what made it even worse is that from 5 to 7 p.m. was the free alcohol, and... Uh, Talk, doing a technical presentation after people have been drinking, I didn't think that was going to work so well. Well, they made the announcement. We had to move the talk, whatever. And then I said, I went to go do the presentation, and it turns out the presentation was in the auditorium. And that's when I figured out that, that, that the talk uh, needed to be moved. For whatever reason, I was shocked. More people signed up for the debugging talk than almost anything at that year's tech ed. And uh, the reason I'm telling you this little story is that someday you're going to have to present at a technical conference. And I learned something very big going after the free alcohol. You always do technical content after the free alcohol because no matter what you say, it's funny as hell. So I almost gave up my job and became a comedian. But it was kind of fun because I was doing this basic thing here, showing you how to set these breakpoints in different unique ways, when this gigantic human being stood up in the back of this 10,000-person auditorium and started waving his hand at me. And, I mean, he's so big. He, he, this guy, when I mean say gigantic, I really mean that. Uh, because I'm an American, I can't translate this into meters, but the guy was 6 feet 11 inches tall, and he was also 6 feet 11 inches wide in the shoulders. He's one of the biggest human beings I've ever seen, and he's uh, waving at me going, hey, can I uh, 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 ask you a question? And I'm like, with a giant human being like that, I better, better do that. He said, well, that was neat that you set those breakpoints in, in your keyboard was control B, because that was the debug uh, new breakpoint break it function menu. He said, now go do that with control D. 
D isn't delta. And I'm like, wait a minute, control D, that's the key stroke that gets you up here to the five combo box. So if you want to like, like, look, look for something real quick, it'll, it'll do that. He said, yeah, he says, go up there and he said, type in your class and method. And he said, now press F9. And I said, well, nothing happened. He said, well, go look at your source code. And I'm like, you're kidding me. He said, yeah, now go up there and type like your overload, okay? And I press F9. Oh, my God. It's a completely undocumented place to set breakpoints. And I'm looking at this guy going, everybody's cheering. And they're like, wow, this is totally cool. And I'm like, sir, how did you find this? And this gigantic six foot eleven inch tall, six foot six foot eleven inch wide human being holds up the two biggest hands I have ever seen in my life. Each finger was as big around as my thighs, and he just holds those hands up and shouts out, "Hey, dude, with fingers this big, you never know what keystroke is coming next." <laughs> and Turns out he stumbled into an undocumented function because I was talking to him later and he was debugging on a laptop and his fingers were so big, he was up in the find combo box up here trying to find a, uh, a method and he bumped the F9 key and it set a breakpoint. That's how he stumbled into it. So now you know the secret. This, this works uh, uh, very, very well. So this led me to a quest. I, I, I uh, do a lot of traveling. And I don't sleep very well on planes, so it started this whole quest of, like, are there any other undocumented tricks up there? So I called a friend of mine who was pretty high up on the Visual Studio team, and I'm like, hey, Andy, what, what other functionality is up there? What are the cool things are in this fine combo box? Are there any other secrets up there? And so I'm on the phone with Andy, and Andy just said, yes, and he hung up the phone. <laughs> so uh, that didn't help out a whole lot. But since I don't sleep on planes, I'm looking out for you. What I did is I sat down and I started with Control A, and I've worked, worked my way through. I've got an Excel spreadsheet of all the keystrokes I've tried that gets everything going. So what, what other things I learned up here is, say, for example, you've got a file in your project. You can type in the name of the file and hit the keystrokes associated with edit.openfile. And in my case, that's Control Shift G, and that command, that will open the file. Another thing I found out is there is a command window in Visual Studio. So we'll go to View, Other Windows, and Command Window. And this is where we get the nice little, you know, where you can execute individual commands. Like, you know, there's help with that. You know, and uh, you can go, you know, so it's a very convenient way to execute some things. Well, I was in the Find Combo box one day, went up there, and I was trying to type in, uh, a you know, a searching XML. So I wanted the end of an element and the next element to be, a, you know, it was, a, it was a weird search. But I started with a greater than, and I started typing, and I kind of went, that's not right. It turns into a mini command window. So it, who knew? But let me show you one of my favorite Visual Studio tricks of all, and it's a command window trick, since we got the mini command window up here. What we can do is that you can start with the greater than up in the find a combo box. You can do the same thing in the command window. And if you type O, F, space, and then start typing, does everybody see what's going on? It auto-completes so that you can go open files in your solution a whole lot easier. This, this is how you deal with big solutions. Now, we have something very similar with the, if you're using the productivity power tools with the solution navigator. Uh, you can do that. But this was the way to open files for a long time. So, whew, you know, just kind of neat, undocumented things up in that fine combo box. Okay? So just thought I'd mention them since we were up there. So let's go... Uh, Let's go do some work here. Let's go program our debugger to stop when we want to stop. So the first thing I've got here, let's go look at our, our for loop here. So my for loop's pretty straightforward, and I want to stop. Oop, let's get the question here. No, Pierre, this stuff I'm talking about works on Visual Studio 2008 and forward. I'm, I'm using Visual Studio 2010 uh, because it's the released version. I figure most of you are using that. But everything I'm talking about here works from 2008 forward. And most of it will work in 2005, but I seriously doubt anybody's uh, using that. So we've got you covered. This is all stuff you can – once we're done with this talk in 35 minutes, you can go back to the office and start doing it. Cool. So – and it even works in Dev 11. You know the pre the preview build if you want to. So you know no, nothing we're talking about is 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 specific to Dev 11. 
So let's go back and look at this for loop, very common operation, is, uh, you know, you don't want to sit there uh, pressing go 10 million times. Say this, this was a loop to, to 100 million. The last thing you want to do is set a breakpoint and then skip that loop 10 million times by pressing go 10 million times. You've got better things to do with your time. So what we want to do is we want to program these, these breakpoints. And how we do that is you know, we get to the breakpoint properties. You can get to this from the breakpoints window. You can get to this from uh, right-clicking like I did. And the first one I want to talk about is the hit count. And this is a nice little trick that allows us to pick a count or basically ha ha provide an index on the fly. You know, the default is to break always, but, you know, we can do equal to, multiple ever greater than or equal to. And I have to warn everybody, those of you that are C-sharp developers, this is a one-based count, not a zero-based, like you're used to thinking. It's a one-based counter, so add one to all your conditions. So let's look at multiple of, right? Think modulo. Remember that from college. So we'll do modulo three. And how do you know an advanced breakpoint is, is inactive? Because Switzerland shows up in the, in the margin there. Look, hey, it's a Swiss flag. Because as we all know, the Swiss are advanced. If any of you from Switzerland are on the line, you can feel happy. But, you know, if we look at that uh, breakpoint there, you can see that it's got my count in there already. So we'll go ahead and execute this. And we'll get my, my autos window going here, and I'll do my big loop, and we stop. And sure enough, that was, that was it. We stop when I is equal to 3, or, uh, be, because I started at 0. That's why it shows the value 2. So we're doing every third time that we execute through here, right? No big surprise. But, you know, this saves you a lot of time because if you suspect, hey, I, I, I know that the 10,000th iteration is bad, now you can stop on the 9,999th and, and be done. But wait, there's a little bit more. Let's get the question here. Uh, Ritesh, let's get, let's hold that question. Uh, uh, I'll talk about that as we get through, uh, uh, in here. So you can always set a breakpoint in the source code. That will do it. Uh, and the object initialization, that's setting a breakpoint on the constructor. Uh, that's the only way you can set those. Okay? So just set it in the source code where you want it to stop. But let's go back and look at uh, some fun here, because there's more to this breakpoint than just the counter. So I'm going to bring up my breakpoints window again, and I want you to look and see if you see anything interesting on that highlighted breakpoint there, right? What you see is that not only do you have the hit, hit count, you also see how many times it's executed, okay? That is really a critical piece of information, because there's two, two places where I use this a lot to solve some problems. The first is a for each, right? You all know about the .NET for each or, or some of these enumerators. You don't have an indexer with it, with I enumerable and things like that. It's, you know, for, for each, you know, for X in collection go, right? So how far through the collection did you get? So what I'll do is I'll set a hit count breakpoint and set the number to like 100 million. It's an unsigned integer. Go as high as you want. Go up to 4 billion if you want to. But then when you, you run, you know that you're having an unhandled exception in here. When you hit that unhandled exception, you flip over to the breakpoints window, and <coughs> ta-da, you get to see which iteration it was that caused the problem. So that's the first way I like to use these breakpoints. A second way I like to use these breakpoints is kind of narrowing down where some problems occur. So here's the scenario. I, you know, this happens to me all the time. I, I've got this very, very strange bug. So I know, this is my theory of debugging. All the bugs occur in two areas of the application. The first is in code that's almost never executed because it hasn't been tested that well. The second place where bugs occur is code that executes all the time. That's where off by one errors and things like that manifest themselves. So what I do when I'm trying to get an idea of kind of what's going on with this flow of this application is I will set tons of breakpoints and set them all over the place so I can get an idea of where the issues are by based on their hit counts, how many times it's been executed, because, and then I will start my code reading in the areas that got hit very little and the areas that got hit all the time, because it, I, that's always seems to me where the bugs are. They're never the stuff in the middle of the, of the curve. It's always the stuff on the edges. You think about the bell curve. So this hit count is a very, very nice breakpoint because you know, it gives you that indexer on the fly. So let's clear those out, and let's go look at another, the second of our breakpoints here. So we've got a, uh, let's get back to our hit count, or location here, so F5 through that. So we've got that loop again. Let's talk about the one you're going to really spend your time with, and that is your good old conditional. So let's right-click here. Let's go look at this condition, 
and I want to look at a condition that uh, uh, we build up. So we can we can do things. This is kind of got multi phases with it. We can simply do I has changed. So what this will do is it will save out the value of I or the object, and it will basically say has it changed or not. Now some of you are thinking, ooh, would this tell me if uh, if I put an object in there, would this tell me if it's uh, anything in the object changes? No, this is not a deep copy analysis. Under the hood, this is basically a pointer of, of validation. So what they're looking at is if you put an object in there, does the object have a different pointer? In other words, does it point to a different object in the garbage collected heap? So it's not as it's not a deep copy, you know, or deep comparison kind of situation. But you know, you can watch objects when they execute through this location. Well, the main one we're going to talk about the is the is true. So we'll do i equal equal three, and then there's our checkbox that will disable the condition. So if we want it to come back, so there's our our, our checkbox, you know, and and uh, but it saves the condition. So no big surprise. What do you think this one's going to do? It's going to break when i equals three. There's Switzerland again, all nice and cool. So we've got that condition there, so we can execute through. And uh, let's look at our big loop again. And ta da, i is equal to three. Right, no, no big, nothing too exciting there. But this, you know, you can and and or to your heart's content. But I do want to show you a, a a scenario that is kind of surprising about this breakpoint, and this catches people by surprise when they go to set it. So if you look inside the scope here, I've just got an I and an M. I don't have any other variables uh, and none at the global scope. But if I go to condition, and this is what catches people by surprise. If you set something like, like this, and X, Y, Z, Z, Y does not exist in the current scope, here's the surprising part about this. Number one is that it doesn't tell you there's an error. Okay? And the reason for that is that the first validation, when you press OK there, it's just basically looking, is this lexically correct? I mean, is there a left value, a right value, and some sort of conditional in the middle? That's all it checks. Okay? So it, it doesn't do any validation. It just says, well, yeah, based on token analysis, this looks reasonable. So it doesn't do any, but it doesn't say that, that like, X, Y, Z, Z, Y isn't in scope. So let me show you what happens here when you go execute it, though. When you hit the big loop, Whoops, now we've got the little bit of the issue. So we go back here, this is where it does the actual analysis the first time it's been executed. So this is telling us, hey, X, Y, Z, Z, Y does not exist in the current context. That's why, you know, so it's a two-phase uh, a validation, right? And so a lot of people get surprised by that, but it's just the way they implemented it. The other thing I want to show you here before I press OK is you look over in the margin on the left-hand side, you'll see there's no way. that That's the symbol that means that breakpoint will never, ever, ever be hit again. So, you know, just keep that in mind. That's kind of, you know, what that means. Okay. Um, Ram, yes, it, okay, this is kind of a little bit, bit off the topic here. I'll come, come back to the breakpoints in a second. Yes, Reflector, with, with Reflector, Reflector Pro uh, allows you to step into, uh, 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 step into things with, uh, uh, without source code. You can sort of do that with uh, uh, Visual Studio, and it's called uh, the .NET Reference Source Code. And you can just Google search for that, and it, the, that'll get you to the reference server, referencesource.microsoft.com. You can do this. Realistically, this is broken more times than it's worth. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't find it that useful, and nor do most people, but that's how you can step in to at least the .NET framework code. You can't step into third parties or anything else. Where Reflect, Reflector Pro lets you step into third parties and everything else. I like Reflect, Reflector Pro. It just always works with this .NET reference source. I swear the server that it's on is under somebody's desk and they kick the, plug, the power plug every half an hour. So it's very, very iffy in, in most scenarios for this. So, but anyway, that would answer your question. Okay? So let's get back here. So anyway, you see the uh, 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 breakpoint there. We will never hit this breakpoint again. I'll press F5. It's disabled forever. Okay. But let's look at something you know else with this that catches people by surprise. So let's look at um, setting another breakpoint. Okay. We'll set the breakpoint there. We're going to right click and we'll do condition. And just to show you how wild this is, is that a valid statement? Look hard at that. Okay. 
Well, no, that's not a valid statement. You know, I'll press OK, but uh, we'll execute that. And what happens here when we go into the big loop? Oh, my God. How freaking amazingly cool is this? What did we just do? We set I to 3 from the debugger. Think about that for a minute, because you can see in the output window there, based on what the source code does, it basically just sits there, and, you know, we're stuck in this loop because I never gets over 10 because we changed the state of the app. How awesome is this? I mean, this is amazing stuff. You know, let's, let's break in there. This is really amazingly cool stuff. Do you see the power with this? I think I just scared some of you. But the real power with this, okay, get the question here. Uh, right, J.D., that would, you know, uh, can you do this in VB? No, this happens to be something that C Sharp does. I equal 3 is the conditional, so there's no way to do this assignment. But what I'm about to show you will work in VB. It's just the assignment that wouldn't work, okay? So uh, you're probably thinking, this is scary as hell, because now I can have the debugger screwing up my app. Well, let's look at this a different way, because if the debugger will allow me to assign a value, can I now do the holy grail of debugging? Okay? So let's take a look at that. Let's get our breakpoint set. Can I do the holy grail of debugging? So what we can do here is that we can right-click, go to condition, and you'll notice that I've got an SB value and scope here. I wonder, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you see what the holy grail of debugging is? Calling a function, calling a method, when I want to call that method from the debugger. So the fact they put IntelliSense in here with tooltips and everything else, they didn't put this in for their health. They put this in because they want you to do this, right? Now, let's think about why is this important? Why am I so excited about this? Because there are some things that you just can't tweak with a simple and and or statement. So, for example, I live in Seattle, right? You know, the home of Microsoft, across, across the Lake Washington for Microsoft. And uh, maybe my app only has trouble when Puget Sound is at low tide. So how am I going to check that, right? You know, I, I'm going to have to execute some code to go check if it's around low tide time in Puget Sound. And if it is, I want to return true and stop, right? Well, I'm going to have to call a method to do that work. So here's what's totally awesome about this, is now you have the ability to jam in an, a, a condition on the fly that makes the debugger super duper smart. So you can actually put things that are only called in debug builds that you can now call from the debugger to do things like, you know, check this state. Where does this function execute, by the way? Okay. Where does this method you call execute, right? I won't make you do a show of hands, but, you know, a lot of people believe it executes in the debugger. A lot of people think it executes in the debuggy. Most people think it executes on Steve Ballmer's machine, right? You know, who knows? Well, actually, this executes in the debuggy. So what happens here when you set a breakpoint and you call a method on that breakpoint, what it will do is that it will... Uh, actually, through the iDebug eval interface in the uh, uh, system, it will, you know, the debugger interface, it will ask it to go evaluate this code in line with the current instruction. So basically, you can pass parameters, everything that's in scope, you could pass as parameters. You could change the state, of the, the state of your app with this. Right? This is really hugely powerful because it really opens up smart, smart debugging. I want to stop when, and I only want to stop when. Well, go write a condition and a method that checks that and maybe has to do some deep checking, but hey, now you can get some, make the debugger super, super smart. Before I get to the question, I want you to think about one thing. Could you screw up your app with this? Yes, you can. With great, great power comes great responsibility. It's not just for, applies to Spider-Man. It also applies to those of us calling methods from the debugger. Okay? Well, you can. If it returns an object, 
as a condition? You can, Brian. Here's the neat thing, okay? Say you did, like, like let's, let's play with this SB here. Let's do something like this. We can do S, uh, SB dot append, and you can see it returns a string builder, right? So we could append, you know, and you see we get all the, all the values, like we'll append Brian here. Okay, that will return the string builder. We can check that. Is that equal, equal to null, right? We could also start at, and this is where the IntelliSense breaks down. It doesn't quite do the whole fluent dot thing all the way through. But if you knew the type, you know it's a string builder, and you could do something like this, you know, that would do a, a check as well. So even though you call the method that does return an object, think about how you can turn it into a true. And the way to think about this is what you can get away with in here is basically just the stuff around, uh, that you can do inside the parentheses of a conditional. So think about it that way. How would I how would I call that sp.append that returns an object? How would I turn that into a conditional? And like that's how I did it there. Okay. So this is a great question. Ah, uh, Nick, uh, those are actually jitted in the assembly, and they're not just part of the PDB. The PDB has nothing to do with it. What happens is that through the debugging interface, if, if you really want an interesting read, go read the CLR debugging API. Uh, it'll bore you to tears. But I've sat down and read that for you guys, so you didn't have to do it. And in the debugger, it's called the iDebug eval interface with the eval method. And this method, this eval method says, I'm going to take that code and essentially jit it on the fly and execute it like you jammed it in inside that method. And so this is really powerful stuff. So that, that's, you know, the, the function or the method you're going to call has to be in uh, uh, the, the code. But it's, you can, you're basically doing function injection, or, you know, what is called in debugger terms, saying inject this code into the debugger. So it's not just not part of the PDB, and, but it is part of the binary itself. Okay? So good question. Okay. Let's dismiss that question. But now let's tie this up. Where is, the, where is this real important? Where this is most important is what I call assertions on the fly. So let's look at, a, look at an example here. So I've got um, this little view here. And here's the scenario because it kind of mostly fits on the screen. So it's real simple. If M underscore name is ever null, my state of my app is screwed up. Let's, you know, that's what it is. So, you know, we could go look at the field directly. But let's tie this up into a, 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 a method, what I call a, a, an assertion on the fly uh, method. So I've got this method here called check name that what it's going to do, it's going to return true if there's a problem, right? In our case, it's a very, very simple check. With, you know, this is kind of overkill, but I think it gets the point across that I can build just about any amount of code in here that I want, returning true if there's a problem because then it's easy to use. So what I can do here is you can see I've got a check here where I'm using that assert example. Anywhere that it's no, I'm going I'm to check this, so I'm going to go to my condition. And look how cool this is, right? You see A is there, right? It just shows up. In fact, within, there's the help for it. What's interesting about this, I made this method public, <coughs> okay? Uh, I, if it's private, it doesn't show up in the IntelliSense, but there is no such thing as private in the debugger. Okay, I could pass parameters if I, if I wanted to. But there's no such thing as private, public, or protected. They're, everything's public in the debugger. So I could call private methods, but it just wouldn't show up in the conditional here. So there's our check name. Okay. Press OK there. So there you can see we've got this, this call where we're going to go with check name, parenthesis, parenthesis, uh, is true in the process. We've got that on bold. So let's let that go. And you can see in the middle there that I do set it to null. So what we can do, we can do our special conditionals. Ta-da! We stop it because check name returned true. So start thinking out of the box. This is one of the best things I've seen in years because it allows you to really sit down and say, I wish I could stop when, and you probably got a whole bunch of stuff you got to check. I've got to have this data in the database. I have to have uh, the state of the app say this. I've got to have, uh, you know, the third row of that table be this. You know, all of those conditions that you want to stop on, well, go whip up a method that you call, and then you can do some smart checking with it because you're going to do it in the debugger. I mean, this is hugely powerful. Now, earlier, somebody asked if, if everything I was going to talk about worked in C++. This is one thing that doesn't work in C++. So, I, so this is a .NET only thing. But, you know, really start thinking out of the box. One last thing I want to mention about this is I kind of skipped over it. 
is notice that I used conditional compilation because I wanted this method to only be available in debug builds. So what I did is I can't use the conditional attribute because that only works with void return values. Well, to make this work best in the debugger, I need an actual true or false return. So I want a Boolean return value, so I use conditional compilation on it. So this is this this method is no is only available in debug builds. It's not available in release builds, so nobody will accidentally call it, but it's there so that you can do do deep checking with it. And so this, you know, think out of the box. I mean, go sit down after this presentation and go see what you can get away with. You'd be surprised what you can get away with in here because this expression evaluator that the debugger uses for C-sharp, VB, is very, very strong and allows you to do uh, interesting things. Now, somebody asked <coughs> if we could do, like, the, the trick with I equal 3 in VB. Well, actually, you can. The one difference with VB is that you're going to have to write a method that you call from the debugger. Then you can do that assignment uh, uh, inside that method because uh, I equal 3 is the condition. So you can do your assignment inside uh, a method, and then, boom, you're set to go. Okay? So this is really cool stuff. And I, this, is, this is, makes the difference between you spending two weeks on something and two hours because now you're taking advantage of the power of the debugger. Cool. But wait, there's more. We still have more time to talk about <laughs> setting some interesting breakpoints. Next one I want to talk about here is multi-threaded debugging, right? Everybody's doing threads. Okay? Let's get some questions. Ah, oh, Ron, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. The expression evaluator in the debugger is basically only available from the debugger. Uh, but, you know, the... Uh, uh, you, you know, you could write macros or a Visual Studio extension to get at it as you're debugging, but it's not something that's kind of generally available. And if you get, uh, if you're looking at the, the Visual Studio debugging API, uh, or the, excuse me, the Visual Studio object model, once you have the DTE, the, the development tools environment, that object, it's got the debugger object, and that debugger object has an eval method on it, so it's much the same thing. So that's the only way you can get into it, because there's not a general way of, of, of uh, kind of squirting code in. But if you do figure that out, Ron, I think you'll become very rich and famous because I think that's a very common question on the fly. Okay. Um, ah, Sebastian, uh, you know, could you set a breakpoint? This is this is an interesting question. It's a good question. Can you set a breakpoint like a regex, like like a make a system.console.write? Let's go take a look at that, Sebastian. So we'll just give it a try. Uh, so I'm going to go up here and uh, and so I typed in. I'll move this down so you can see it. I typed in the wildcard. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Okay, by default. Okay, from just out of the box with Visual Studio. In fact, a very common thing that people ask for is, um, let me get another code up here. So I've got this little something to do class we showed earlier that just do re mi fa sil you know, just to have a deep call stack. What a lot of people want when Sebastian's asking for is uh, they want something like this, something to do dot star, which would set a breakpoint on all methods in the class. Unfortunately, that's not supported. Uh, nor the wildcards. However, if you wanted to write a regex uh, that used the IntelliSense inside of Visual Studio Macro, you can get at all of this information uh, to do that. Uh, so that, you know, there, there's nothing out of the box, but the pieces are there. You could write an add-in that would, would supply this. So, Sebastian, uh, you know, we've got about another 10, 15 minutes left in this talk. Uh, after we get done with this, you're gonna send, you're gonna do this and then publish it in a blog entry and make every, everybody happy. Uh, because it's a very common request. But this request of setting a breakpoint on every method in a class is actually very, very, one of the most common questions I get. So I did tackle that one. And we'll make these, uh, through Brian, I'll make these macros available. But I've written a lot of macros for Visual Studio. Uh, because why spend two minutes doing something manually when you could spend 20 minutes automating it for life? So I wrote a whole big set of macros called the Winthelic macros. And the one I did is in this breakpoint helper here. I've written a bunch more here. But this breakpoint helper, what this allows, allows me to do is set breakpoints on all doc methods. That'll go through using that IntelliSense information and then set a breakpoint on every single method in a class. 
And uh, this uh, works out very well because then I can gain control over, uh, you know, because I use this for function coverage, right? When I'm doing ad hoc testing, I want to know if, the, if, if this function got called as part of that test. If the function didn't, if the function gets called, I clear the breakpoint. Then at the, then I can go back to the breakpoint window and see, okay, these are the, these are the functions I didn't get called. So I just double click on it, takes me right there. And so, uh, so I did write that one, and you can use that as a basis, Sebastian, for that. You know, let's dig in and do a red because it's just a simple macro, and I'm just accessing the IntelliSense information on it. So, uh, so that's how you could do that, and we'll make those macros available. Uh, send me an email, john at winselect.com, and I'll stick those in there. Oops, okay. Let me dismiss that one. Let's get the other one here. Uh, the, the API, Peter, is, is primarily through the, the, uh, the debugging API, or the, uh, uh, the Visual Studio object model. Uh, if you can get a hold of the DTE, in fact, let's, let's pull up the macros here since we're talking about this. So if you can get a hold of the, uh, the, the, the environment DTE, so you can see how I set all these breakpoints here. I, I do some error checking and whatnot here. Where's the set breakpoints on back method? So, you know, basically what it is, this API is pretty straightforward, and what I do is that I process the code elements. That's kind of your IntelliSense there. That what I do is I go through here, and uh, then basically, you know, I'm processing, is it is it a namespace, a class, or structure? If it is, then I want to go in to go get the children. So I'm enumerating the IntelliSense information here in these macros, and safely set the breakpoint. Then uh, to go to that guy, uh, you can basically see that I asked for the debugger breakpoints collection off of the DTE. And the DTE is the core object. That's basically Visual Studio itself, and then all its sub-pieces are off that. So this debugger here has all sorts of interesting methods off of it, like uh, the e uh, execute statement. You can go execute code. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of how this the, uh, the, the breakpoints on... Um, the, uh, uh, the, scenario, the, the scenario I showed you, calling breakpoints from a, uh, uh, or excuse me, calling the methods from a breakpoint, that's kind of how that works uh, is by essentially through the execute statement. So anytime you can, you just say, go execute this statement, and it'll execute it in that location inside the debugger. So it's kind of neat that we've got this ability to set these uh, uh, various breakpoints like that, and you can see I'm just accessing basically what Visual Studio gives us uh, to set that information. So, uh, you know, if you want these macros, send me email. I'll get them up to Brian so that Brian can post them up to Lugnet. You know, uh, there's a whole bunch of macros in here that I've written. Some I did not write, but I was give, given permission to redistribute. Uh, uh, thanks to my friend Jeff Atwood. You know him from codinghorror.com or better yet, Stack Overflow. He's that Jeff Atwood. Uh, he gave me a couple of his macros I could distribute as part of this. But I've written a bunch of macros that help my debugging, help my day-to-day -day development to uh, uh, to go up better. And some of them get pretty complicated. Like I've been writing this one for a number of years about auto-filling in XML dot comments and stuff. But it's just accessing that IntelliSense information. So that's kind of the API that you'll get through there. Yep. Uh, yeah. Any, any JD? This is a this is a great great question. Is there a way to speed up your application? Um, well, uh, you buy a supercomputer. And <laughs> Unfortunately, what's happening here, it's, it's kind of the nature of Windows. If you have a lot of breakpoints or you have breakpoints set inside a tight loop, here's what happens. So you've got this breakpoint set. So that causes in the debuggy a breakpoint exception to occur, which in turn causes the operating system to suspend all the threads in the debuggy. Then control passes over to the debugger. So there's a cross-process call. The debugger's told, hey, there's been a breakpoint exception. The debugger says, hey, is it one of mine? If it is, or you've got a condition, and it says, uh, say you've got that, that, the uh, hit count set. And the debugger says, nope, let me bump down the count. It hasn't gone to zero. Let's transfer control back to the debuggy. The operating system says, oh, i got to restart all the threads and go. So that slowdown you're seeing is a fundamental architecture issue in Windows because of all the cross-process calls that occur, and that's kind of slow. So if you do have a lot of stuff with, with big loops, we've got a lot of breakpoints, try disabling all the other breakpoints uh, that uh, you don't want to uh, have executing so that you kind of narrow it down. From the breakpoints, um, uh, breakpoints window, you can always disable a breakpoint there so that one gets turned off. So what you want to do is you want to be smart about how you use these. So you say, I only want to use these, I only want to use those, and that way we're in a situation where uh, uh, 
you know, we're not looking at uh, that big slowdown. But unfortunately, it's just kind of a fact of cross-process communication and the OS getting in and suspending the debuggy and stuff like that. So that's kind of what's going on there. And um, let's see if the next question is here. Aura had, had a good question. Uh, can you call backwards from the debugger? Yes, you can. In fact, there's a breakpoint that will help you with this. So let's clear out these breakpoints. And those breakpoints we've got are kind of interesting. Where uh, And what it is, it's called a trace point. So if I wanted to set a trace point, that's another style of breakpoint here, we can right-click here and we can go to when hit. And when hit allows me to print a message. That's why it's called a trace point. And this trace point, you can do things like let's see the value of the, this point. So anything inside curly braces is evaluated there. Uh, we can take a look at, uh, you know, you can see the other things on the screen. But you also have this ability to run a macro. And, uh, you know, you can do things like, uh, like how you can call a macro that in turn reaches up to, uh, enables and disables other breakpoints. So when this breakpoint gets hit, I want to turn all these other ones on or off. You could do things like that. Or I want to go execute and dump out a bunch of data by calling that execute statement uh, uh, API through the object model. So that's how you could do that. Now, the default for trace points is, uh, ooh, look at that. It's a sexy diamond. Uh, the default is to continue execution. If you wanted to stop every time this hit, you're going to go into win hit, and you're going to say continue execution. And that turns it into a regular breakpoint that just calls a macro. And so uh, so that's how you could call a macro from the debugger from a breakpoint itself. Uh, but the macro stuff is available. You can see I'm debugging here, and you can set those breakpoints all day long. Okay? Uh, yeah, hey, Dan. Oh, man, I feel your pain. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, is there a quick macro that will do that? Unfortunately, uh, no. And this is this has been filed as a bug. I don't know. I, you know Dev 11 is still a little too early. But for those of you not familiar uh, where people are having problems, uh, what, what Dan is talking about is this debug exceptions dialog here. And the default keyboard is Control-Alt-E. Control and uh, what it is is, uh, you know, you want to stop. This, this is just real slow to enable and disable these. So the issue is, say you wanted to break whenever there's a system.argument exception, the last thing you want to do is, you know, have to go in, do that, do that. Well, I kind of have um, a, a, a macro here for you called CLR exceptions, okay? And, uh, you know, what I've got is this macro here, break when thrown, and what it does is that you pass the type in. So, Dan, I wrote a macro because I got tired of that pain. So I can go into the command window, the macros window in Visual Studio, and go to the command window and go to macros. .wintelec, somewhere down here. Um, you, know, you can see I've got some, some issues here. Uh, hold on a second, guys. Sorry. <laughs> Just had to close the door to keep some noise out. Uh, so what I've got here is I've got this ability to set these macros. Where's my uh, CLR exceptions here? And um, CLR exceptions break when thrown. And what you can do here is system, system that uh, out uh, of, I'm trying to remember how to spell it. <laughs> And what that would do is that would automatically go in and check that for you. So that's kind of how, uh, see, that will, uh, will break when thrown out. So that's the kind of the semi-quick way to do that. Unfortunately, macros are pretty slow. So, but there's the macro that will do that. So send an email. We'll get it up for Dan, uh, uh, Brian so that he can see all of this kind of stuff. Uh, Dijon wink methods, you're screwed. <laughs> uh, one of the problems you have with link is that there's no way to single step it or anything else. So, you know, that's the, that's the pain. When you accept link, you accept the fact that it's basically uh, mostly undebuggable. You can set breakpoints on individual pieces. Uh, try to set curly braces so you have a scope so you can get a condition. So uh, you want to be very careful, but there's not a whole lot, you, you know, there's nothing more that you can do than setting a breakpoint. But link methods and debugging aren't real hot together. They don't work that well. Okay?
uh, uh, Ritesh, what you're going to have to do is just set, you know, you're just going to have to set a break point on that piece right there. So you're going to, you know, you've got, uh, the best you can do is just put the cursor on that line and press F9. So that's about the only way you can do it. There's really no way to, uh, 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 other than just setting a break point on the line. There's no, nothing special on that. Okay. Uh, Sebastian, that's kind of an open-ended question. Uh, you can do that with a uh, windy bug. It's a lot more painful. Uh, and send me, probably the best thing to do is send the email. I can give you the windy bug commands that will print out when you've got exceptions. Uh, but Visual Studio, you have to stop every time. It's just how Visual Studio was built. Okay? Everybody's looking at the questions. Uh, uh, Basically, just the way I've talked about uh, all of this here, the only difference with debugging a web service or a Windows service is that you must run the debugger elevated. But all of the stuff I've talked about works exactly the same way, whether it's a service, the Windows phone, Azure, and debugging is debugging is debugging. So you just have to attach to the process. Yeah, you could write an extension method. Uh, you know, Dan, that's not a bad, a bad approach. Uh, you know, sometimes the code gets a little ugly uh, with, with some of this stuff. Uh, you know, that would be, uh, 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 it's a way to go about it. But, you know, you know, when, when it comes down to these link statements, it starts getting, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of frustrating to me because sometimes Microsoft sits down and they start designing these features and they never think about debuggability. And, you know, the fact that I can't single step through uh, a link statement is, I think, kind of criminal <laughs> because, you know, we kind of got, you know, I'd love to see the individual pieces of that link statement coming together. I would love to see the uh, uh, scenarios uh, that, are, that are, you know, what happened when you do the when and everything else. Uh, but, you know, they designed this feature, but they didn't think a whole lot about debuggability. I should be able to single step everything in that link statement, uh, all pieces of it, so I could see exactly what the statement is doing as I'm debugging through it. So, uh, unfortunately, you know, the idea that Dan has here, you got to, you know, pick and choose what you're going to do. Uh, and it's just kind of a, it, it's a sore point with me because link is very useful, but it's very hard to debug. That's where you'd use the trace statement for, the trace statement. Remember that, Ron? You right-click here, you say win hit, and this will give you uh, the ability to print a message. So this way you get output when it's executed. Okay? Now, we're not done yet because I'm going to get through. I've got one more condition here to talk to you guys about, and that is um, this. Uh, oops, let me get this out of the way. Uh, I want to talk about multi-threaded debugging here real quick. This will take about five minutes, but I really want to talk about it. Because we're all doing multi-threaded debugging now, and we all want to do, uh, uh, you know, good multi-threaded debugging. So let's talk about that. And Visual Studio has a nice thing built in. So I just fired off a bunch of threads that don't do a whole lot, just so I can show you some multi-threaded debugging. Now, I've broken in to the debugger, and let's go to debug windows here and look at our threads window. And uh, the threads window will pop up here, and that will show me all my threads and kind of takes a guess at where they're at. So those are all the threads that are running. And if I go to one of these threads, let's switch over to it, all of these threads here from these last set of threads down here, these are all doing uh, the same thing. They're just blocked on this weight object just to have something to do, nothing exciting. But they did give me a chance to show you how, you know, multi-threaded debugging. So right now, if I set a breakpoint here, what's going to happen? Uh, that I'm going to stop on all of those threads, and I don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to gain control. So uh, since I've got my threads window up here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take advantage of the last of the properties called the filter. And this filter is kind of cool. because Don't you love the white space on this dialog? That's a lot of white space for a simple edit control. But this is where you can set per machine, per process, and per name, uh, uh, excuse me, per machine, per process, per thread breakpoints. So I'm going to do a thread ID equal, equal, and I'm going to pick a thread ID, and I'm going to pick 4,600, because that one feels good. So there's 4,600. The yellow indicates that 3448 is my active thread. So I'll do OK. That will set my filter. And when I press F5 and I click the button that, that signals that event, there we stop when uh, that thread 4,600. So we do have this ability to set uh, breakpoints per thread pretty easily. Another way we set breakpoints is per name. So the question becomes, how do you name a thread? Well, that has to be done from the debugger, and that's where you right-click here and you say rename, and we'll call it Bob. 
Oh, better yet, I should call it Brian because he's running the thing here and we want to be nice to Brian. So we'll call that thread Brian. If I wanted to set another breakpoint, now that I've named that thread, I can right click here, go to my filter, and I can do thread name equal equal Brian. And there we'll stop when that thread hits the Brian. So there, there we hit. So that's how you name the threads. You just kind of do that from the debugger so that you can gain that control over your multi-threading. Now, we do have some other things for multi-threaded debugging. I'll just mention them uh, very quickly. And the first of those is uh, our parallel tasks. If you're using par parallel tasks, which are kind of cool, you can look for the different tasks. I don't have any in this program, but uh, I do find quite useful the parallel stacks. And this is just an alternative way of looking at where all your threads are, kind of in a big glance overview, so you can kind of see what's going on with some of that multi-threaded debugging. Okay. So, whew, we survived. That's what I wanted to talk about today, was the different ways you could gain control to take a break in the debugger. And I hope I was able to show you a bunch of cool stuff that will make it a lot easier for you to uh, debug these kind of tough problems and to help program the debugger. So uh, what I want to do now is remind you what my email address is. If you have any questions between now and the end of time, uh, that's what John at Winnewick.com is all about. So if you have any questions, uh, please send me an email. We'll get up on the uh, LidNug site, the, uh, my macros, so that you guys can start playing with them. Um, all the macros are incredibly well commented because I know a lot of people don't do macros, but hopefully you'll be able to learn from that and, and some of the tricks that I was setting. Uh, like Dan was asking about how to set, you know, break, uh, uh, turn on some of those options uh, for the exceptions dialog. Some of the other macros in there will help you out. And uh, feel free to email me if you have any questions. So cool, guys. Let's open it up uh, to any questions, and I'll uh, keep going. Hey, thanks a lot, Sasha. I appreciate it very much. And I'll answer any questions anybody has. Hey, John, i got a quick question here. So I don't want to spend the time in here. Um, how, much of, how much time do you think uh, people spend unnecessarily on debugging? <laughs> According to Steve McConnell from the greatest, book, uh, greatest software book ever written called Code Complete Second Edition, he points to research that says your average team spends 50% of their time uh, debugging your performance tuning, right? That's why a manager, right, you know, if the, if the manager gives you an assignment, you say two weeks, they write four weeks down. It's just kind of an industry uh, known value. Uh, I would suspect, uh, to, from what I've seen, well, it depends on the team, depends on the problems, but uh, I do see a lot of wasted time because people, have, you know, just, you know, you don't debug some of the hard stuff every day, especially if you get in some of the stuff we talked about last time with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the SOS and Windy Bug and things like that. Uh, some of that stuff, I've seen people spend weeks. You know, but I, you know, even in my development, I mean, you know, I know how to use the debugger. I've written debuggers. I probably spend at least 10 to 15 percent of my time going down stupid paths, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, because, you, you know, you know, we're, we're in, you know, when I started in development, you know, I'm an old guy, uh, I started with DOS, and I mean, you can keep everything in your head, but today, you need a stack of books, you know, six stories tall just to have a clue what's going on, right? You got Windows, you got, you know, web services, you got HTML, you got JavaScript, you got ASP.NET, you got, you know, all, you know, the technology that we deal with and the complexity are, are amazing. I, you know, when my computer starts up in the morning, I'm thrilled. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that's what goes into it a lot is, is just the, the absolute strange complexity that goes on. And, you know, .NET hides a lot of things, right? You know, that last talk I did about the, the memory references, you know, they hide that from you. So that, that's, yes. that's where a lot of problems come in. Oh, okay, Dan, the, the, the last window I showed was uh, the uh, uh, pa parallel stacks and parallel threads. And those are off debug windows, uh, parallel stacks. Uh, I, I don't know what version of Visual Studio they come in. I'm using Visual Studio Ultimate. But this is uh, uh, the parallel stacks just off the debug menu. And... Um, also, the macros, uh, I don't, I don't, not sure where it'll be on the net. We'll probably have a link up on the Winnelex site. Uh, just send me an email, and between Brian and I, we'll get it figured out as to where we can post it so folks that listen to this in the recording can have access to it as well. Okay? We'll probably put them up on lidnug.org, I would think. Perfect. That's fine with me. And so, yeah, I'm sure Brian and, 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 and Peter will probably put a link 
uh, on the talk when they, when they do the archive and all of that. Uh, send me an email directly if you want. Uh, uh, one faster. <laughs> Debugger versus unit testing? <laughs> you do both, man. <laughs> you do both. Because uh, I, I do a tremendous amount of testing in the debugger. Because, uh, you know, we didn't have time to go into it today, but there is incredible power in this debugger for ad hoc testing. So you don't have to write a lot of tests. That I'll do some manual tests right in the debugger. Uh, I, you know, heck yeah, you do unit tests. And you debug uh, at the same time. I, I think any, you know, some of these zealots who say you can go off and just do unit testing and never have to worry about debugging. I like those guys because you know we debug people's applications for a living at Winolab, and they we make a lot of money off them. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and think unit test all you want, but if you don't know how to debug, you're screwed. Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, so uh, uh, you know they go so they go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. So uh, that's how I fall. <laughs> oh, more. Oh, good question. Um, that's a, you know, you know, it, it, I, <laughs> uh, you always have to do tracing and logging because, you know, if, if you're always running the program under the debugger, you never have to do any tracing, right? Because you've always got it under the debugger. But that kind of defeats the purpose of production. So, you know, having a great tracing logging system is incredibly important for solving production problems. Where did you get? What's the state of the app? You know, uh, you know, sitting down and taking advantage of very, very strong environments that we have, uh, like, like event, uh, uh, ETW, Event Tracing for Windows. That's not the event log. The ETW is the super, super fast tracing. Uh, so you have to sit down and make tracing a feature and make logging a feature so that it, that you, you know, in fact, what I like to do with my teams at Winelec is uh, basically during the sprint, uh, we will sit down and say things like, okay, this week nobody can use the debugger. You must do all your debugging from the trace logs. Why? Because we want to go find out before we go into production with code that we've got problems, you know, that, that there's sufficient tracing to solve problems. You know, uh, we may do, you know, now we may go to the point where we do, okay, you can get a mini dump and then you have to use WinDebug and SOS. But, we, you know, we try to not use Visual Studio for periods of time so we get some of that practice with, with uh, production stuff, right? You know, debugging in a production environment. And so uh, that's, you know, that's the way we found to make sure we have sufficient tracing and logging uh, inside the system. Okay? So uh, it's hard to do, but you got to do it. Ah, Sebastian, yeah, there, you can do a debugger, debugger.log is what you're thinking about. Unfortunately, debugger.log, there's no processing on the message. Now, if you were using WinDebug uh, in native code, uh, you could do this in .NET as well. WinDebug has the .o command, and what that allows you to do is you say .o command to prefix, then what WinDebug will do, any trace statements that comes through uh, with uh, uh, of that special prefix, anything after the prefix will be treated as commands. But, you know, doing that for .NET development is kind of painful, but there's, no, you know, that's the only way you can do that uh, today. But there's nothing been written for Visual Studio that lets you do a debugger.log to tell Visual Studio to go run this macro, go do this check, or anything like that. Ah, Brian, remote debugging. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, first off, the Best thing you can do that today, this is talking about Visual Studio 2010. Today, if both the, the local machine where Visual Studio is running and the remote machine where, where the, the re remote, ah, the remote machine where your application is running, if both of those machines can be on the same domain, life gets easy. That's the best hint because remote, .NET remote debugging is done through DCOM, right? There, I just gave some of you on the call a heart attack. Remember DCOM? It's scary as hell. So, uh, but DCOM pretty much requires that you have uh, uh, the the machine set up, both accounts, uh, uh, using the same account and everything like that, and then you can, then you can debug all day long. Uh, so that's the best tip I can give you. Uh, now, if you don't have uh, that scenario, right. I can get to a blog entry if I did. Um, and this blog entry is um, about remote debugging across uh, uh, different domains. 
Okay, and uh, what you can do here, uh, di different workers, different domains, this shows you the steps that you have to go through if you have that scenario. But the problem is, is that now you're running the remote debugging piece, MSVS Mon, on the remote machine. That's what does the debugging. Then Visual Studio connecting to it, you're running them with a different account. So all sorts of permissions problems come into play. Uh, so, uh, you know, where like diversion control and things like that. So it's not super clean. So by having both machines on the same domain, life well, just got easy. But I have good news. I have great news. When we all move to Dev 11, this problem goes away because they got rid of the DCOM requirement. They're doing remote debugging just through straight TCP IP. So if the two machines can ping one another, you'll have you'll have remote debugging like a dream. So that's how we can handle that. You did, you, uh, if they don't generate symbols for it, you're not going to be able to set a, a, a breakpoint on it. So, you know, basically just put your cursor on the line and press F9, and that will set a breakpoint on that. Okay. Uh, I haven't used that tool. I've, I've seen it. It's kind of, I've got this list in one note of different tools, you know, that I, I paste in blog entries and stuff. So when somebody starts asking about, about this, other than seeing it, I haven't used it. Uh, if, but if it solves problems for you, awesome, you know. Uh, you can never have enough tools. <laughs> but I personally haven't used that tool. I've just kind of always, you know, what's always kind of worked well for me, especially with, with, with uh, WCF services and stuff, is, uh, you know, just a ton of logging. Uh, WCF, mm, you know, it's, uh, um, mm, it's, it's its own beast, man. And I think it might be some of the, uh, you know, just the overhead, you know, what happens when you have an exception. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things that you just kind of look at it and sometimes go, wow, you know, what were they thinking when they did some of the things? But I haven't used that tool at all, other than seeing it. Uh, I haven't used it. Okay. So cool. Any other questions? Any other questions? Doesn't look like there is any more. Okay, maybe we should call it a night. <laughs> well, for you, it's an early morning. The attendee numbers are dropping anyway. I think people are logging off now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, looks like it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, as usual, it's a very educative uh, topic you pick, and uh, it was definitely um, interesting to see some new uses in our round debugging. And I hope that uh, people here took some of that with them, and they will be a bit more productive in the future with the debugging. Yeah, well, good thing. Thank you very much, guys, for having me back. It's a lot of fun. It's always fun to talk to you guys, and I know what's going to happen. I'm going to get about 70 emails from this group, so that's why I really enjoy talking to these, these late night things. So good stuff, yeah. good stuff. <laughs> well, we want you back again. I've certainly learned a few things that I didn't know, and I usually dig around with uh, weird and bizarre stuff like this in the IDE. <laughs> well, good. I, I did my job. I did my job. A lot of stuff.